Hey listeners, this is Nick, and welcome to another episode of the Books of Some Substance podcast. Today I'm chatting with musician Ned Russin, who is known for his work in Title Fight and Glitterer. He also recently published his first novel, Horizontal Rust, out now on Shining Life Press. Ned picked Ben Lerner's Leaving the Atocha Station as a book that has been an influence. So listen in as we talk about it and Ned's own approach to writing music and fiction, as well as many a digression on Lernerish topics like experience versus experiencing experience, or the nuance of using language to describe language, or how everything is really just a translation of something that could never really be expressed directly in the first place. In short, this is going to get real specific and also real vague. But before we get into the conversation, here's a clip of the new Glitterer track, Are You Sure? from Life Is Not A Lesson. Enjoy. things about this podcast is kind of overlapping that music and uh, and writing element. I've kind of noticed that there's this Venn diagram overlap, and I'm going to include Ross from Ceremony and Al from Dangers, previous podcast guests of uh, you know the hardcore hardcore musicians who have a little bit of a literary background. And so you seem to fit very well into that as well. And so I'm curious, what what led you to you know study creative writing? How does that pair with with your work as a musician? You know, it's it's funny. It, it feels like it pairs very closely and it, it feels completely separate at the same time. I got into reading seriously, you know, for the second or third time as an adult. I read when I was a kid a lot. Um, I read when I was in high school and then I kind of fell out of it until I was touring and I kind of wanted something... I don't want to say intellectual because that sounds mm-hmm. very like hoity-toity and, and needless. But, you know, I, I just wanted something to like engage my brain. Um, mm-hmm. And so I picked up reading again. And the thing for me, the, the reason why I feel it's similar to music is because when I started getting really into reading and it was it went beyond just, you know, a kind of, I don't know, thing to pass the time. I started to think of it as something that I would want to do just to, in the same way that I, when I listen to music, it made me want to play in a band. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it just seems like the way that I think about things, and it's through my experience in hardcore, is like if you're interested in something, you just try to do it. Mm-hmm. And so I, I had tried to write stories. I had like been interested in it, uh, never really went anywhere with it, just kind of like, you know, doing it for fun, just having a hobby. And then when I got to school, I saw that it was and even before I was fully enrolled. I had I did community college before I was like a full time undergrad student. Um, I had like kind of daydreamed about MFA programs. Like I'll, I was thinking about creative writing just because it's something that like I like this thing and therefore I should try it. And so I I started going to school full time in January 2016 and took a creative writing class and I was like, yeah, I like this. I'll just do it. At the same time, it feels different because it's like the process is so completely different. I don't know, just the way I think about it, the way I engage with it, the way it it seems to work in my brain feels totally different than music. And I think that's part of the reason I'm tr- attracted to it is because it, it it is just like another thing to try and, I don't know, figure out another puzzle to, to like work on. And yeah, so it, it just kind of like went naturally from there, kind of pursuing both at the same time. Until this point, you know, when I've actually like written a book and put it out. Yeah, so writing fiction is kind of the original DIY. <laughs> yeah. Just, just fucking do it. I mean, so I, I, I'd like to pick your brain a little bit on kind of what you see the differences in, in writing music versus fiction. Because I'm, kind of, I'm kind of comparing, you know, the new record and, and your book. And I, I see some commonality. And I also, you know, I think of uh, new glitterer songs are kind of these condensed pop exercises in a lot of ways. In your book, while, you know, it's still relatively compact. I don't think a lot of people would think of it as pop writing. It's almost like an exploration of boredom or, or reality, I would say. Mm-hmm. And so in some ways, they, they feel a little bit divergent, but I still see some common threads between the two. So yeah. does, that, does that allow you to, you know, do you express certain things better through music versus writing? How does, how does that shake out? Well, the thing is, music is multidimensional, of course. You know, it's like you have the melody you have the harmony, you have the chord structures, and you have the lyrics. And the thing about it to me is that I am like most attracted to like melody 
I'm most attracted to like the the texture of chords and how they interplay and all of that is set within parameters of western music you know like i i feel like i understand the way that that stuff kind of works to a certain extent just because i've listened to music my whole life you know like mm-hmm. you you have a note you can only go so many places from there you know you have a chord there are only so many chords that will sound quote unquote right after that and so in music it feels like when i sit down to write music and I'm speaking just like the the notes, not the lyrics or anything. There is something that I'm kind of like tapping into and kind of just like trying to speak a language that is like very specific and, you know, is already predetermined, Mm -hmm. which is funny because when it gets to the actual language part, like the lyric, the lyrical writing, the lyric writing and, you know, and how that compares to writing prose, like that's completely different because the lyrics still like, I, I want to say something and I have something in mind, but oftentimes I try to start off with a specific word, with a, a phrase or something that fits in the melody because the melody is super important to me and I want it to like work as an idea and I want to say something and I have something that I want to get across. But at the same time, I need it to fit like, I, I need it to sound good, you know? Mm-hmm. That's like super important to me. Prose, on the other hand, even though it's like within language, it has certain parameters it is it feels so much more open ended and so when i like I, I have certain things that i'm attracted to certain ideas certain concepts and they've been recurring in my writing since i was a kid and there's definitely some overlap in content between lyrics that i've written for any band that i've done and the prose that i've written i think there's like a certain kind of like I think there's a certain kind of like yearning that every sort of artist has. And it's like, it's, it's this kind of search for like, I don't know, whatever, like kind of vague grand word you want to use, like some search for like completion or something. Mm -hmm. And everything is kind of in search of that. And so everything kind of has like the same goal. Like I'm trying to feel good about myself. I'm trying to make sense of what's going on. I'm trying to do these things. And so the words have a similar goal, but in writing prose, it's, it was so different because it wasn't like, I I guess there's rhythm. You have to like make it sound good on top of having plot and like these things kind of work together. But it felt like there was so much more room to expand on these ideas. Um, And I think that's something that attracts me to prose is like, yeah, glitter songs are short. There's a reason for that. Um, (laughs) And it's, it also like, it, it just kind of like, it gets the idea out quickly. And people ask me to explain the lyrics and I'm like, the lyrics explain themselves better than I can explain them. You know, it's like they, they, they are there and that's what the, you know, they give the meaning of the song prose. There's obviously analysis. There's all this stuff along with it, but yeah, like I, I feel the need to like spell things out a little bit more and it's pulling from the same place, but it's, it's uh, you know, it takes a lot more to get there. I feel like. Yeah, you have uh, the main character in Horizontal Rust has this uh, kind of thought process where he mentions, you know, specifically in writing courses, wanting to crave an, an unrealistic idea of reality. And I was thinking about that, taking the record and, and the book together, where a lot of times music, like you said, because it fits into this form that, that gives you X number of spots to go, it is sort of a limited reality in some ways. It's a it's a more condensed, more um, maybe even accessible if we're talking within pop music way of communicating a thing versus uh, the character goes on to kind of go on a fairly large digression about you know how modernism versus uh, realism has influenced american writing and writing the western world as a whole and those to me seem to be very divergent but at the core there seems to be i don't know a desire to explore what that reality is but at the same time like you said if you ask what the lyrics mean or if you try to dig into them too much you're you're kind of you're kind of missing it. You're going a little bit below the surface because that's what it really is anyway. It's already it's already in front of you. So I guess I'm curious, does that is that an accurate representation? Am I picking up pieces that that fit together logically? Or <laughs> is that my interpretation of these? I don't know. I'd love to love to hear, you know, your input on that. I, I agree with what you're saying. Um I think I agree with what you're saying, but I also kind of tend to, I mean, like I'm speaking about like the language and the grammar of music and the language of language is much more complex. 
but the thing is we're still like the parameters are still there um i'm you know i'm not super well read in like theory and criticism and philosophy but the things that like have i i have gone and sought out and i have read are these kind of like i don't know post-structuralist ideas kind of uh deconstructing language you know and that comes out in the book a lot but you know i'm interested in in like in the sign i I like wittgenstein you know like i like these things and so i think that and I, and I also i got into that like later in life but that kind of like colors my understanding of language in a similar way that i think you're talking about the music you know mm-hmm. it, it's i don't it, it gets really complicated really quick yeah exactly i don't know it feels unbecoming to like try and and act like i'm an an expert on this thing but you know but it is something that i think about and i just think that music and and prose have like uh i don't know they they can both get there but it's it's very different kind of journeys and it it can have very different outcomes cuz you know like in discussing pop music especially it's like i don't know we put a lot of our we put a lot of the depth on like simple things you know mm-hmm. like the Beatles are not like revolutionary lyricists to a certain extent, you know, like take the early Beatles, for example, you know, like Mm -hmm. those aren't like really deep thoughts. They're like expressions of love. They're expressions of longing. It feels simple to a certain point, but when you like, when you get in it, you're like, wow, this is, this is a representation of me. This is how I feel. This is like super deep because I feel like this touches me in a certain way. And I think that is like tied up in a lot of different things, but it it is never coming across as like this super profound thing and language attempts you know i guess prose attempts to be like profound in that certain way and it's like really difficult and that's also something that i talk a lot about in the book and i think a lot about in writing is like this idea of the cliche this idea of like the loss of power of language due to overuse this idea that like uh, th- this like yearning for originality and authenticity in not only in thought but in you know, just like in delivery of your daily life. And mm-hmm. so they're, like everything kind of gets tangled up in that place for me, you know, um, for glitter, for writing, for everything. It's like, that's kind of where my head's at right now. And when I kind of like, I try and be, I, I try and just kind of let things happen naturally. I try and let lyrics kind of like flow out and try and like catch them. I try and let prose like not feel super labored over. But there still is like everything kind of like going on behind the scenes at the same time. Yeah. You mentioned language and the language of language. And the more you look at that, the more complex and, and sort of the depth of the abyss is real when you start to, to get into those details. And I feel like that's exactly kind of what I was thinking, prepping for you know the topics of this podcast, because a lot of this stuff trying to, uh, you know, look at what reality is and, and, and look at things through different lenses of how it's represented in music versus, versus prose versus other art forms. It can have such a level of simplicity, but it can also have a level of complexity. And oftentimes it's almost, it's the lens we look at it through, right? Mm-hmm. And our choice of the lens too, right? And it's just, I was trying to figure out how to best <laughs> represent that topic. And that fits extremely well in, or it fits in extremely well with, with uh, Ben Lerner's Leaving the Atocha Station, which I've been cycling on for the last week or two after reading it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this book for, for listeners um, is essentially uh, an expat in Spain um, who's on a, a poetry fellowship. And he's, I guess we can say, a little bit of a slacker, uh, certainly does a lot of drugs and drinks a lot. But most of the book is this conversation he's having with himself about language and what translations are and his relationship to language and his relationship to the real world and vice versa. And so I, (laughs) it's almost hard to dig into these because it's such a level of minutia, but at some point it also feels very universal. So if I can tie all that together, I am curious what, what has sort of drawn you to this book what led you to to reading learner for the first time uh i i got this book in 2016 uh after i read a short story of his on the new yorker um i kind of got into reading through the classics you know um which it feels pretty common and then after i hit a certain point and i read some of the i don't know more contemporary writers i i felt like 
more excited, um, more interested and drawn to them. And, and so I was kind of on like a quest to find like a actual contemporary scene that I wanted to like not be a part of. Cause I, I think about it in terms of like a music scene, you know, but it's like, I, I just wanted to like feel like I belong to a team in a certain way, you know? And I read, mm-hmm. I read learner in the New Yorker and it was just something that clicked with me. I, I really enjoyed it. And I, I went to, you know, the bookstore and I picked up a Tosha station and I read it really quick and it just felt like, felt like something I wanted out of a book. You know, it was intelligent in a way that doesn't beat you over the head. It was like, it's funny. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also kind of just like realistically sad. Um, Oddly more emotional than I expected it to be. Yeah, yeah. And it it kind of like just hits all these beats really, really well. And also he he's Ben Lerner in real life as a poet as well. And so like just his command of language is is really, I don't know, captivating. Um, it's just certain little things that like you, you read a line and I'm just like amazed by it, you know? So it kind of has like all these things. And I just like, and, and I got, th- I was interested in auto fiction. I don't know the exact timeline, but like, I don't know if I read this before I got really into auto fiction, but like, this is a book that kind of like made me want to, made me want to write like that. Made me want to like read authors like this, made me want to be involved. And so that was, I don't know, this, this book is like an important moment in my kind of like, I don't know, journey to in as a reader and as a writer. Yeah. That you're, you mentioning kind of wanting to find like a contemporary team, right? That's like exactly what was going through my head. Cause I have a friend, uh, I guess Justin Bean, if you're listening to this one, who's kind of recommended me Learner a couple times. And before Tocha Station, I actually went and read his other books, mm-hmm. Pika School and uh, 1004. And I was just like, holy shit, like this is, this is my team. I had actually been avoiding a lot of contemporary stuff. Kind of like you said, it's almost like a little bit of a, an obvious thing to, to focus on a lot of the classics. Uh, but when I read this, I mean, this and basically W.G. Sebald, to me, go together relatively well. And those are my contemporary-ish, I guess, notes that have really connected with me. Mm-hmm. And so I'm kind, of, I'm kind of very personally invested in this topic because, you know, we explore a ton of different books in this podcast. But this is the first one in a little while where I'm like, oh, this is, this is it. This like clicks with me. Mm-hmm. And so thanks for teeing that up, I guess. Yeah. But uh, you, you also mentioned a thing, you're talking about the texture of chords and the texture of certain things. And to, to kind of frame this, I want to read a section because this is one of the quotes that I had pulled out from a Tocha station. And so uh, Lerner writes, these periods of rain or periods between rain in which I was smoking and reading Tolstoy would be, I knew, impossible to narrate. And that impossibility entered the experience. The particular texture of my loneliness derived in part from my sense that I could only share it, could only describe it, as pure transition, a slow dissolve between scenes, as boredom, my project's uneventful third phase, possessed of no intrinsic content. But this account ascribed the period a sense of directionality, however slight or slow, made it a vector between events, when in fact the period was dilated, detached, strangely self-sufficient, but that's not really right. And so instantly when you started talking about texture of chords, I was like, oh, that's a nice connection to Lerner talking about the texture of basically a moment, the texture of, I don't know, the way that you can't really ever pin a thing down because if you do, you're basically translating it, you're morphing it into another topic itself Mm -hmm. and then you've distorted it. And that has been resonating with me quite a bit. And so I think you've kind of also touched on that from the music side. There's There's another texture quote. I took a photo of this. Uh, he writes, without texture, time passed. That's late in the book. The, yeah, yeah. He, the way he's talking about texture is so interesting there to me. And it's something that I think a lot about. And I like, the, I you know, you, you talking about the quest of reality, I think also makes me think about this as well. But it's like the majority of life is something that we'll forget. Mm-hmm. The daily minutia that makes up most of our time is something that's just redundant and you know, insignificant and learners touching in that, on that, in that passage that you read, it it feels like to me where it's, you know, there's so much that we want to capture that seems senseless in a way. And yet it's like still so it's, it's not important, but it's like super important, you know, just because it is, it's a part of our lives and therefore that makes it significant. And it's a part of everybody's life, which makes it extremely significant. Like the, the, the idea of boredom as a texture is really interesting. And something that I feel like, something that I was trying to, to touch on 
with horizontal rest as well. It's that there's a lot of stuff in our lives that we don't know how to make sense of it. And it's not that they are tragic or, I don't know, something that these like important big moments, but they're still there like nonetheless, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you had a section uh, in Horizontal Rest where the character is talking about almost being lied to at a certain level by the by the Raymond Carver school of of minimalism of taking these these relatively insignificant moments and giving them an aesthetic giving them extra importance but still that somehow feels a little wrong in a way because they're actually not that important yeah they may have an aesthetic yes or no but but they're still just just that so that's a, a different distortion in a different way and so that yeah i feel Definitely learner obsessed with the texture and also not a far cry from texture being the concept of negative space Mm -hmm. and specifically negative space in language, which is, of course, a huge function of poetry in general, right? Poetry plays as much with the words on the page as what's not on the page. But he seems to apply it, even though he's fluent in Spanish, he finds that the character himself, he finds that if he leaves the space open, his friends or, or the women he knows will fill in the space with what they assume he's trying to yeah, to communicate. I, I love that. And I, I love that so much, partially because it was brilliant, but partially because he's just a shithead. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, he's, he's always saying, like, I'm not fluent. And then everyone says, you've lived here for six months. Yeah. You are like, you can how express do you think- everything you want to. Yeah. I, I, I forget where I was. I was on tour in Europe somewhere and someone was talking about how they weren't fluent. And they basically said in English, they, they were saying they weren't fluent in English. And they said, I don't know how to say this type of thing. And I was like, you just said what you're trying <laughs> to say. Exactly like that. Yeah. And it's like, you may not know the exact specific, like whatever little word that you're looking for. But you just got the idea across. And that, like, that is what Adam Gordon, the protagonist, is kind of going through. It's like, he doesn't believe he is capable. I, I don't want to say believe he's capable. But he, he often, like, presents himself as incapable of accurately, I don't know, depicting, maybe not even accurately depicting something. But, like, just kind of, he, he doesn't believe himself to be a real artist. You know, he doesn't mm-hmm. believe himself to, like, actually know what he's doing. And yet everyone around him tells him, like... No, you're you're like a talented poet. You're here. You're on a fellowship in Spain because you're a talented poet. You know, like all these things. And so, I don't know. I, I like that tension and I like that he uses translation as a way to get it out. Also because everything is obviously in Spanish and he writes, you know, every, all the dialogue is in English, of course. And so there's like a weird tension there where you are trying to, like he, he often talks about trying to like, he's translating poetry in the book and he talks about trying to get the right words to represent, you know, the poem accurately. And yet here, everything is in the entire book that is rendered into English and therefore had to be moved over to the correct language and represented accurately. Um, So there's like a weird divide there that's at play throughout the entire book that goes unacknowledged. And his, his style of writing poetry, he talks about in the beginning, relies on almost inaccurate translations Mm -hmm. is that he uses them as a jumping off point that he gets sort of close and then he just twists it until it becomes something else. You also see that in, you know, his conversations early on with, uh, with Isabel, um, where he mentions as she's telling him stories, he sees these different parallel paths because he can't fully grasp the meaning. So when he's a little bit early in his uh, fluency in Spanish, and so thus he has this sort of plurality of meanings that he's working through. And so he has this real-time sort of translation aspect in conversation. And then he's also using a similar concept of, of distorting the translation for his own work. And then, I mean, you make an excellent point in the fact that, you know, this is all rendered entirely through English as the protagonist is laying it out. Therefore, there must be an additional layer there too. And so... Very quickly, at least I start to feel that there's almost this fantastical element to this, even though it's it's embedded in autofiction and it's very much kind of a modern sort of realist kind of first person narrative. Yeah. But it feels I almost I mean this is a this is a stretch, but I literally feel in some sense that Adam Gordon is almost like a Ferris Bueller where reality just doesn't touch him. You know, whatever he does, it's sort of just buffered by this by this luck. Everybody tells him he's great. Everything works out for him, despite 
all of these bad decisions that go along with it. Yeah. I, I want to read the copy on the back of the book, which says Adam Gordon is a brilliant, if highly unreliable young American poet. I think the idea of Adam Gordon being an unreliable narrator is super interesting. I think the the concept of the unreliable narrator is, is like interesting to begin with. Absolutely. Because it's like, it does, I, I mean, yeah, th- their take on reality may not be accurate, but like, who cares? That's what you're getting. You know, like you, it's a book. Yeah. You can't go to someone else's perspective. I mean, none and of so, our takes on reality are accurate. Yeah, we're exactly. All, we're all fucking, the second you talk, it's fiction, right? It's Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's all a fiction. And so this idea of like everyone telling Adam he's great, like it might not be the case, but it doesn't really matter. You know, like all these things going right for Adam. Yeah, like that could be far fetched and it could be fantastical because there is like uh, it's not like everything goes right for Adam in the book, but enough goes right that it, it feels like kind of, I don't know, unrealistic at times, mm-hmm. but it doesn't really matter. You know, yeah, it's what we're given and it's what we have to work with. And it's it's like a lens that we could look through, like to to figure out, I don't know what learners trying to say. Regardless, we have to look at the text that gives us this, uh, I don't know, this relay of reality. Mm-hmm. Yeah, He talks a lot about to the, uh, the concept of experience, which I think is embedded in a lot of these, quote unquote, expat narratives. Right. Um, but he also talks about the experience of experience. I feel like this is an extra layer to that reality where there's kind of a, a key scene where he's having um, a, a chat in an internet cafe with um, one of his friends who's in Mexico with his girlfriend. And they have this, this tragic scene in which they uh, are swimming in this river and they watch a woman drown and uh, he tries to revive her, but she's already dead and it's, it really rattles his friend. But his friend's girlfriend almost seems a little unfazed by it. And he mentions that, you know, maybe she's just basically accumulating information for her novel, essentially. Mm -hmm. That she's looking for the experience of gaining experience. And that feels like a kind of a profound commentary on on a lot of modern life, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. But also, then it rolls into the fact where, where Gordon himself ends up stealing that story for his own benefit, trying to build sympathy when he talks to uh, to people on top of other lies that he said that his dad's a fascist and that his mom died and or is dying. <laughs> yeah. So at some point, it's it's almost it's almost eloquent in a way that like how terrible this person is. But then he very quickly has no problem doing the same and manipulating it for himself. Yeah, I think one of the great things about autofiction is that it it makes you kind of question reality in real time which is uh, it, it's it's complicated because i like to believe in the death of the author i like to believe like that you know the text is the only thing that matters but i also love auto fiction because it makes you think about like what is real and what isn't it's it's almost i i think auto fiction is almost in a way like reclaiming like the the life of the author mm-hmm. and i really resist that because like i don't want to think about did this thing actually happen? Is this real? But when you read stuff like that, you think about, you know, did Ben Lerner have this experience in real life? It doesn't matter if he did, you know, but like at the very least, you can say for sure some people like that you have experiences and you are excited to have them. If you're like, even if you're not Ben Lerner putting in a story, if you're just a person, you're excited to have this information to have a good story to tell people like down the line, Mm -hmm. you know? It's like, it's just something that we do as humans. Like we, we try and communicate and we like to have these kind of significant, unique moments that we can relay uh, that make ourselves seem interesting and exciting. Maybe that's like a dark way to look at it. You know, at like maybe it doesn't have to be because it makes it look unique, but like it's just nice to have something to talk about. It's nice to have like some story that's exciting and interesting to tell people. Um and so much of Atosha Station, to me, kind of reads like a fight, like a, a struggle, an inner struggle with that kind of like idea where Adam Gordon is critical of that. He's, you know, when they talk about the girlfriend using the story for her novel, they're like, man, like obviously presenting that in a bad light. And mm-hmm. then fast forward two chapters and he uses it himself, <laughs> you know, and it's like, 
it's um I don't know. It it feels like acknowledging the the inconsistencies, the the hypocrisy, but it being so like deep inside of ourselves that it's still like it, it's just natural for it to come out, you know. Mm-hmm. Um I think there's like there's a lot of interesting stuff at play there beyond that, just because it you know, it does deal with an idea of reality, an idea of narratives that I think Atosha like is touching on a little bit and and pretty specifically at times. Um and then again it's like all within a book, which is a narrative object, you know. Yeah. So it's like all these different layers going down and down and down into this thing where, you know, it it makes the story more than just, I don't know, uh like this kind of like stupid silly story about like a poet who's a fuck up who lives in Spain. Yeah, and you you mentioned kind of like, you know, because it is auto fiction and we're sort of getting this view into either a person's truth or their fiction or reality or not reality. We don't actually know. Um but it it feels it feels nice accessing that. But there's a funny layer to that too where in one of the critical moments of the novel uh when the Atosha station is bombed and Gordon goes to see it essentially because he's nearby and he sees firsthand the damage uh that was done he sees people who are injured it's it's kind of a traumatic event and he comes back and slowly he finds himself almost forgetting or replacing his real memories with the photos and things that he then sees online and through the New York Times and stuff mm-hmm. like that yeah, and so even though he's he's writing as presumably the narrator, right? He's depicting this, and obviously Lerner's writing it, but it's coming via Gordon's voice. Uh, and then he's basically replacing his own memories within this narrative that is probably distorted or unreliable in in some way. He's just going ahead and also editing them in real time and kind of admitting it. While everybody is trying to check in with him, making sure he's alive, he's surrounded by all that. But he he also sort of just retreats into another fiction within the fiction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like you said, it's not it's not just a silly story about drinking too much abroad. It's it has these things that are hard to pin down. And uh, going back to that early point of the language of language is learner is just killer at breaking that down. You know, mm-hmm. it's not one or two layers. The whole thing is is all connected, and I'm just incredibly impressed by that, and feel a little bit like I have found my contemporary fiction team. <laughs> yeah. So it's just it's very much there. Yeah, it's. I I think the setting really helps this book as well because the the book came out in 2011. You know, it's obviously set a little bit before that. It's like he talks about uh, Adam Gordon talks about how. He told everybody that uh, he doesn't have Wi-Fi at his apartment, and so he has to go check his email at an internet cafe, which is a lie. He mm-hmm. is, like mentions at one point he doesn't have a cell phone. It, it's just in this era where these modern amenities, which are so normal now, only ten years later, were not a thing at the time. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and so it disconnects Gordon a little bit from that sort of reality. Um, that kind of like constant connectivity, uh, that kind of, I don't know, social media, whatever you want to call it, you know? And so he has access to it, but it's not like driving, uh, I don't know, his character, his desires. Mm -hmm. But when it comes in, yeah, it's him like reading the times and like him talking about being at the bombing and yet, like, looking at the picture on the times of the helicopter or whatever, you know, like that moment. Mm-hmm. It's, it's stuff like that where these things, which are much more apparent now, are, like, completely inescapable. But here's someone struggling with it when it's not even, um, you know, as part of a, our daily lives as it is yeah. now. Yeah, it's not, it's not ubiquitous yet. And essentially, it's, it's sort of forward-looking in a way about how much we're just inundated with that. And you're right, if, if this is a small fraction of what he's going through. And it's hard for him. Like, do we even know how much of our own memories and how much of our own perception is sort of being replaced in real time by this stuff? Yeah. That's, I mean, if you want to, if you want to talk about an abyss, 
like you know are you <laughs> are you having any anything authentic you know going yeah. on inside your brain or is it just really are we just totally jacked in at this point and mm -hmm. the it's just too hard to look away from all the sensory stuff yeah it's and even to a certain extent the the I guess we could call it like the real sensory stuff that he experiences if we are to believe you know the stories that we are told in this book mm -hmm. they they are like modern things you know it's um to a certain extent there are like kind of i don't know classic stories here of you know what travel uh love um things like that but the i don't know experiencing a terrorist attack feels pretty modern um right i don't, I don't know if i want to call it a terrorist attack experience a bombing um experience like it's just all these things it's like there are things that could only happen now in the book, you know? And um, I think even without the the social media aspect, without this kind of like replacing ourselves with fiction, it's still like to just look at certain aspects of our daily lives still kind of like brings to mind that everything feels unrealistic to a certain point, you know? Mm -hmm. It, uh, I don't know, maybe... Uh, also, when I say that, it feels like everyone must have said that all the time forever. I'm sure somebody, like, was like, the television, people talking about this thing, like, that's insane. This has yeah, got to be, like, a course. modern... You know, like, cer certain things like that, like... Mystery novels in the 20s. Yeah, everyone feels like their <laughs> contemporary moment is so unique and interesting, where it's like... Right. It's just... The, it's not like it's the same thing over and over again, but it's the, that that thought process is, like, repeated so so often time and time again you know yeah. but yeah it's it's uh i don't know that modern aspect of the book i think does a lot of like it, it does i i think it helps the book tie a lot of these theoretical ideas together yeah there's also also built on that is the topic of performance or rather maybe planned performance one of my favorite scenes toward the end is when he basically gets roped into doing that uh i guess that talk uh, with a couple of other renowned authors and academics. Mm -hmm. And in order to prep for it, he basically writes these non-committal responses in his head for yeah. whenever topics come up. And he knows that he must chime in a certain number of times in order to participate, but he doesn't want to overextend his, overextend his bounds. And so he basically looks for the time to interject these nicely, tightly contained thoughts out there. And people love it. And then he basically gets caught in it when somebody asks him a direct question, which is yeah. a really simple question. Just name some stuff that you like. Yeah. And he basically trips all over himself. And that yeah. that I love because I'm going to break the fourth wall a little bit and say that, you know, I, I prep some stuff before we have these kinds of conversations. And I'm like, oh, shit, I want to get in something about performance. I want to get in something about, you know, this aspect of reality. And I was like, oh, am I am I like that? Is so much of conversation and what we do, do we have a planned performance that we're basically just waiting for the moment to enact that? Or are we authentically making adjustments and communicating or, you know, doing whatever in real time? Like, is it is it a charade or is it is it actually accurate? And so that one, I don't know, that really connected with me in a level that I'm still not totally sure on. Yeah. The, I mean, I, I think the opening scene of the book does a good job of like displaying the kind of like discrepancy between the profound experience of art. Oh yeah. That's, that's my favorite. Um, <laughs> it's between like expectations of, I don't know, standard kind of like uh, we, we can say like in this instance, like specific kind of like questions that you're supposed to ask or just ways in which you're supposed to act in situations. Mm -hmm. Everything is predetermined to a certain extent, you know, it's like, you have to ask, it's not like you have to ask a certain question, but if you, uh, I don't know, if you engage with something in a certain way, certain things come out. Mm -hmm. You know, if you if you want to talk about, I don't I don't want to say it's like, if you're talking about fiction, these the kind of things are going to come up, but it, you can kind of go that big. You know, it's like, if you want to talk about art in a certain way, you are going to say specific things. Mm -hmm. there, are just, there are just like lines on the ground that we follow subconsciously or consciously. 
and they they guide what we're doing. And the beginning of the book starts with this scene where Adam Gordon's in a museum and a person comes in and looks at a painting and starts to weep. And Adam Gordon's like, that's weird. I've never had a profound experience with art. Um, you know, and it, it, it just brings your attention to something like, where do you like fall within the path? You know, it's like, are we just doing this thing? Are we just kind of like going down the road that's already been laid down for us? And how does it look to step outside of that? Even though weeping at a painting is not completely outrageous. And you mean, you mean the royal we, not us. We're doing original yes. stuff right now. Okay, yes. Good. All right, we're good. Only authentic, <laughs> unique things from me. Um, but yeah, you know, it's like, what does it look like to step outside those bounds for a little bit? Um, and it's not, uh, I don't know. It's not like an, it's, it's an exciting, unique thing, but it's it just like makes you uncomfortable to a certain extent. Yeah. It's like, it's a weird thing to encounter. And I think, yeah, it starts with that and it, it like, it plays within... I don't know, like what, like you were saying, like within negative space and within the things that are laid out, like how much of this is is just following a trajectory that's pre-planned. So that topic of stepping outside bounds is almost kind of my perception of how the novel ends, right? So he, he ends up at a poetry reading for his own work translated by Teresa. And the last couple lines of the book are fantastic. I just want to read them. He goes, Teresa would read the originals and I would read the translations and the translations would become the originals as we read. Then I plan to live forever in a skylit room surrounded by my friends. Yeah. And there's a lot of ways you can interpret the last couple, you know, paragraphs and scene of of the novel. But one thing it does seem like is a conscious decision to try to step outside the bounds, right? He's supposed Mm -hmm. to be this poet and she's supposed to be the translator and it's supposed to operate like this. But he has such a tricky relationship with language or maybe he's just being evasive throughout the novel. And so in some ways, you know, you kind of get the impression that if he is a little bit of a fantastical character, that stuff mostly works out for him, that maybe Teresa is the real artist who's just kind of been propping him up throughout this. Um, That's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is he knows how it's supposed to go, but he wants to kind of collapse the difference between, you know, the originals versus the translations to to put them evenly together. And the only way to do that is to essentially swap them in real time. And so I think think there is a tangible shift right at the end in kind of moving away from that sort of aimless trajectory of bouncing around and and avoiding things throughout the novel to where he he almost makes a tangible decision and i feel like it's based around that concept of trying to trying to actually own your own kind of authenticity or own your own thing instead of it always being filtered through a translation or an experience or something that's my theory that i'm i'm picking up out of this yeah i i i love the ending i think about it and kind of, I don't know, I feel like this is something that I've been touching on throughout our interview already, but I, I think that the, I, the, the, I don't know, Adam and Teresa switching roles, switching languages, switching, you know, whatever the idea of like the original works well with the idea of um, kind of like the limitations of language, exploring the, the absurdity of the absurdity of that to a certain extent, and also the kind of the insignificance of that um you know it's like adam gordon is a poet which means that he has a a very like specific idea of language and the use of it more so than a novelist or a journalist or anybody else because you know a poet writes condensed language their work is supposed to do a lot more with a lot less and so to me, when I read the ending, I think it is about like stepping outside the boundaries, yeah, but also not believing in those limitations, like the limitations of language for a little bit. It's it's uh, I I read it very optimistically. I read it like language can be something that we are. I guess we we've been talking about this a bunch already. It's like language can be something that we are contained within, you know, and it it can feel predetermined there are Mm -hmm. only so many you know if you want to be understood you have to say these words in a certain order and once you get doing once you do that then it becomes like there are only so many phrases that you use there are only so many words that you can use and yet somehow there still is like 
significance in that. There still is power within that. There still is meaning behind all that, even if the meaning of the word is if the word itself is just like gibberish sounds that we have concocted to try and relay a very specific abstract meaning, you know, and it feels like at the end, Adam kind of like is able to let go of those constraints for a little bit, mm-hmm. you know, and I guess it's the same thing as stepping out of the bounds, but it it's like, I read it as like accepting the boundaries and like forgiving the boundaries at the same time, you know, yeah. because in order to relay anything, not relay anything, like you can, you can relay an idea through a painting, which doesn't have language, but in order to process that, we are processing that through language. In order to tell someone how that makes you feel, you have to like mm-hmm. relay that in language. And so we're set in this trap. And at the same time, the trap can be, it can lead to uh, something profound. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, I, the thing is, that's like my kind of like my, my big thing. I love the idea of like the, the using the limitation of language as a way to get to, I don't know, whatever word you want to use, something profound. It's um, constrained art. Yeah. Everything is constrained to a certain extent, you know, mm-hmm. and it's, it's not just like making something uh, and kind of like this goes with with hardcore like the way that I think about it because that's kind of like where I learned all these ideas it's like it's not like you write a hardcore song that uses the same four chords that every other band has used forever and like that is uh I don't know that can be like an epiphany can be something profound but if you do it the right way you can kind of unlock those things at least like for yourself and I think that works like it that in itself kind of like ties together a bunch of things that i'm thinking about like that ties like that works so well with the auto fiction element it works with the constant talk of like the language and the translation um with like uh adam telling stories that aren't true with concocting these kind of like false realities like it builds to a moment where like within all of these things that screw us up there is still access to whatever beautiful thing there is You can still, at the end of the day, plan to live forever in a skylit room surrounded by all your friends. Exactly. (laughs) Uh, Well, thanks for hanging out and chatting and providing all that insight. This was, like I I think I've said it like five times already, but this is a little bit of a, like, oh shit, this is my kind of book. So thank you for kicking me in the ass to to read this and by uh, proximity the other learner books because I'm totally hooked at this point. And uh, yeah, so... Thanks for thanks for hanging out. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, cool. Thanks for listening. You can find out more about Glitterer at Glitterer.com. That's G-L-I-T-T-E-R-E-R.com. It's a David Foster Wallace reference, which is, of course, very fitting if you just listen to the last hour of discussion. Life is Not a Lesson is out now on Anti Records. Ned's novel Horizontal Rust is out now from Shining Life Press, and I highly recommend checking out both. You can find out more about us at booksofsomesubstance.com and on Twitter and on Instagram with the handle booksosubstance. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to go think about the texture of reality for another few hours. Cheers. I mean, there's only so many loops around the reality of reality and the language of language that you can...